So the talk was about was entitled CT, but it's a broader thing about perhaps more about imaging and what kind of imaging to use in the diagnosis of heart disease generally, CT being probably the kind of the newest kid on the block. Um, so certainly, um, in the thing about cardiology is as general practitioners, you're probably aware that cardiology is a lot about diagnostics. Um, and we rely very heavily on diagnostics, which means we're a very multidisciplinary kind of team, which involves a lot of reliance on technicians to, do, to help us uh, with our diagnoses. Um, now, where these diagnostics can be um, applied, obviously, in this forum, obviously, it's largely about diagnosing angina. But increasingly, the applications is trying to get to things before they become angina in either screening asymptomatic patients, that's particularly worthy in diabetics, considering that within about a seven-year framework of the diagnosis of diabetics, about 50% may have some degree of coronary events. Um, increasingly, I mean, in the old days, do you remember when people used to ask you, am I going to be all right, doc? Do you remember those days? Yeah? They don't ask that anymore. They'll say, you know, what percentage stenosis is there in my coronary artery? <laughs> and, and therein lies a misnomer, because the bottom line, if I had to summarize here, being an angiographer anyway, is that it's angiography and coronary stenosis is not prognostic. So I'm trying to get it back into the frame of getting people to ask again, am I going to be all right, doc? It's all about prognosis and how certain diagnostics can help you with that. Because at the end, you know, you need to know that in terms of how you plan things, how proactive you might be. Um, the NICE guidelines, I have to say, I think are very useful. Um, in, but uh, if you had to sort of summarize what the NICE guidelines offer in recent times over and above what you've been led, is that it is much more clinically orientated. And for those of you that know me, I'm first and foremost a clinician. Listen to the patient. And so, you know, increasingly I get, I, I get quite frustrated with young doctors that, a bit like fishermen, they cast this net of diagnostics in the hope that you might drag a few fish in. And no one likes to commit. So I love the guide, the, these guidelines because they empower you, you know, you guys and me guys, to actually make a clinical decision based on symptoms. And that's, why, that's pretty cool, I think. Um, but like all these things, often in relation to the clinical description are some diagnostics. Um, obviously, in the field of chest pain, there are cardiac causes. And remember, it's not always about sort of you know, ischemic heart disease, although it is the elephant in the room. Um, certainly in younger people with chest pains, we see them. With women with chest pains, there are other diagnoses that should be considered including madness. Um, but, and we'll come to that towards the end. <laughs> um, obviously, non-cardiac causes, gastric, etc. cetera. Um, certainly, you know, because a lot of the guidelines to stimulate a certain diagnostic path depend on what they call pretest probability, and I'm sure Dr. Archibald addressed that. So you're going to be guided what seem like non anginal type symptoms, like, you know, whether it's pleuritic in nature, uh, whether it's gastric sounding. Now, therein already lies a problem, because one of my favorite subjects is women's heart disease, and I don't know if I've spoken to some of you in the past in relation to that, uh, but women tend to present with a lot more atypical symptoms. So some, some of these things that you see up here may apply more to women, and that's probably one of the reasons that, you know, the prevalence of, of coronary disease in women is often underestimated and they tend to present later. So making the diagnosis, we try and use from this old American Heart Association thing, the uh, Diamond Forrester thing of pretest probability. And it relates to kind of four things really, typicality of symptoms, age, risk factors, and ECG abnormalities. Mindful, however, that about 60% of people presenting with an acute coronary syndrome may have not had any previous symptoms, and about a third of patients may not even had risk factors. So, I mean, the, the adage in terms of risk factors is the absence of risk factors should not preclude the diagnosis of angina. The pretest probability helps you in two areas, the two 
red crosses. That if you, th you know, from either calculations using the pretest probability, it comes out at 10% or less, you don't really need to do any tests. Save some money. Um, and the other thing, which is often a misnomer that uh, colleagues of mine don't appreciate either, that if your pretest probability is that high, you don't need to do any tests either. You treat them. You know that scary thing, treat them? Yeah. So um, that's it. Now, what the typicality of symptoms? We all know that, constricting, tightness, relieved by GTN, etc. Now, as I said, women may not necessarily have that. And it might be that the underlying histopathological basis for coronary disease in some women may be different. Um, and in particular, may, people may present with surrogate markers of ischemia, like breathlessness, reduced effort tolerance, palpitations. And uh, these need to be sort of factored in. Of course, they cover nebulous areas. I mean, the vast majority of people with palpitations, they will be benign in nature. So sometimes it is a, a bit of a jungle to try and get through to the diagnosis. Um, as we said, there are less exertional symptoms in women. More, you know, they may get more predominantly sort of neck-related symptoms, symptoms at rest, which you would either call non uh, atypical symptoms, or it could be, you know, oh, it sounds like unstable angina because they're getting chest tightness at rest. Um, now, the thing about them I alluded to is their histopathological basis is slightly different. They have less evidence of obstructive disease, i.e., if you have a woman and we've seen them all and you will continue to see them that present to you with chest pains, it sounds a bit atypical. You've kind of not been convinced because you think their hormones protect them that you kind of amounts to fobbing them off or you know, wonder if they're mad or not. Um, and of course, a certain percentage of these eventually have angiograms, which a, a fair proportion are angiographically normal. Now, there was a time where I'd pat myself on the back and say, you know, good, the angio is normal. A certain percentage of these still infarct because they don't have obstructive coronary disease, they tend to have more erosive disease. And so it can still present late. And I had a case, in fact, fairly recently, where they did that, and it was a sort of terminal vessel dissection that had occurred through sort of weakness in the wall. So bear in mind that women who you may have seen, you've referred them to cardiology, they may have had casts that were normal, supposedly, or non-obstructive, may still have underlying ischemic heart disease, and their chest pains, even if atypical, may reflect underlying coronary disease. It just happens not to be obstructive, but you know, they're still symptomatic and you would treat them anyway. Risk factors in the, in the NICE guidelines are important. They, you know, I always say risk factors help rule in the diagnosis, but don't necessarily rule, diag rule out the diagnosis. Now, also in women in particular, you could weight various risk factors. And I would say in women, hypertension is a weightier risk factor. You know, we've kind of gone through phases where hypertension is so prevalent, we almost ignore it as a risk factor. <coughs> but, you know, you say, oh, her, she doesn't have any risk factor, just a bit of hypertension. Well, that might count relatively more than it might in men. And of course, a lot of the guidelines race. I mean, coronary artery disease in the Asian population is about four times higher. And the kind of people that escape the net is those sort of little Asian ladies who might be somewhat sedentary, who might sort of escape through the net. ECG abnormalities is another prerequisite in sort of the pretest probability for the NICE guidelines. Of course, most people presenting with angina will have a relatively normal ECG. And so a normal ECG, in my mind, wouldn't preclude the possibility of coronary disease. Risk factors. I've put them down there on the bottom red. Snoring and poor church attendance were the original risk factors. <laughs> you know, we're talking 16th century before tobacco was invented. So uh, why do you, uh, anything from, we'll make this interactive. Why do you think snoring was described as the original risk factor? Any idea? Yeah, sleep apnea, because you get hyperadrenergic stimulation, which lowers your threshold for ventricular fibrillation. So these people would drop dead. So that, of course, didn't have an un any understanding of coronary disease then, but it was noted. And poor church attendance, what might that reflect? <laughs> 
low socioeconomic status. In those days, if you didn't go to church, you were nothing. How times have changed. Yeah. And always think about newer kids on the block in terms of risk factors over and above the usual ones that we are all aware of. Is autoimmune disease, you know, rheumatological conditions. Remember, the underlying process in coronary disease is an inflammatory basis, whether it's spurred on by infections, repeated infections. I did a thing in the Daily Mail not long ago. God preserve me. <laughs> I'm the pro-statin guy that fights for statins in Daily Mail. Um, I haven't got as far as the Daily Express yet, but I think that's a bridge too far. Um, but, um, you know, I did a thing about commenting on particulates, you know, and sort of smog and, and, and uh, high-density populations. And I think the underlying basis is they say, oh, another 40,000 deaths occur in, in crowded cities because of dust. is probably inflammatory in basis, yeah? And so autoimmune diseases, also slightly more prevalent in women than men, ought to be factored in. But they don't appear on any Q risk or anything like that. Um, I have an interest in limb amputations because of sort of vascular effects with the subject of another talk another time. And bear in mind, one of the, per, you know, the earlier markers of uh, vascular disease in general is erectile dysfunction. How many of you regularly ask male patients about erectile dysfunction when quantity? you know, assessing for vascular disease? N not many. A, a, it might be so, so socially a bit awkward and, and, and do that, to do that. Um, you know, particularly as maybe as a female doctor asking a male patient with tattoos uh, whether you should, should do that. <laughs> I dare you. <laughs> but it can be difficult and challenging to do it. But remember, it is an important thing. It may be the first indicator of vascular disease in general. It makes it more complicated when looking for the alternative in women, but we'll come to that. Um, now, so then we move on to calcium, calcium scoring as the first line, and I'll come to that of these, and I think Dr. Archibald did address in the lowest risk of having coronary disease, so that will be between 10 and 30% pretest probability. The, the recommendations include a calcium score. Less and less of us are doing calcium scores at the moment, I guess mainly because the radiation doses uh, for CT are so much lower now that you might as well just find out what you want to know. But there's still a lot of adage in calcium scoring because there's a lot of evidence that's been accrued up till now. Anyway, one of the cool things I've gleaned recently um, is in terms of this is sort of area under the curve stuff so these are like the traditional sort of Framingham things. But if, uh, if you add calcium scoring to sort of risk factor analysis, it, inc it provides incremental value in deducing whether someone may have significant cardiovascular risk. So it is a very, very low dose of radiation, the equivalent of a chest X-ray, and none of us would blink about doing a chest X-ray in someone to sort of you know, increase the sort of analysis of whether someone has underlying coronary disease. Um, now I talked a bit at the beginning about screening asymptomatic patients. And as you can see, that the, as coronary artery disease progresses, in, in fact initially you see sort of this bit to this bit, actually um, in the earliest stage of coronary disease all the processes affect the wall of the vessel. And in fact, the coronary arteries actually get bigger. The kind of things get stretched open a bit before eventually obstructive things sort of start moving into the wall. And um, as I said earlier, certainly the diabetic population. Oh, yeah, I have this diabetic colleague of mine who's a bit sort of not much eye contact kind of guy. And um, he was sort of, I don't know if you met most diabetologists or some of you may have an interest. They're often apologists. You know, you find that? You know, they kind of look at the ground and, and anyway, my guy is much cleverer than me. And he, he came to me and I said, you know, we should work together. That I, and he said, well, you know, I'm no longer a diabetologist. And I said, what, what do you mean? And he said, well, I'm a risk factor for coronary disease. <laughs> um, and I, but that is, the, the guy I said, he's cleverer than me. It's so profound, isn't it? Because what do these guys get? Coronary disease. So it's less about the sugar and more about the cholesterol and the blood pressure in these patients. And uh, 
there is a large move, and certainly in the American Diabetic Association, for pre-test screening of diabetics, because half of them are going to get coronary disease in seven years. Um, sort of, so there's, there's a fair amount of adages about screening them. In diabetics, so this is what a CT angiogram might look like. Look sort of coronary artery there, sort of milder disease there, more sort of angrier disease there. And these are roughly the, the, the percentages of what they see in asymptomatic. So 57% of them will have at least a mild stenosis, of which they may be asymptomatic. So then it's kind of like, what test would you do? I mean, CT is one of them. They used to have a lot more choices. Have any of you sent people for sort of carotid intimal medial thickness sort of ultrasounds? Because there was a lot of these things around that you could do. But now the evidence is most strongly in favor of CT over and above all the other tests. So I think CIMT is on its way out <coughs> using ultrasound carotid imaging compared to CT. Age, we said, is another pretest probability. And if you look at everything, include, do you remember the old Sheffield tables for assessing people? I mean, if you're over 70, you're in the red for most things, aren't you? <laughs> yeah? Which is, to me is bad because when you have a 25 year old woman with familial hyperlipidemia with a cholesterol of nine, she invariably turns up in the green sector. And I always think, you know, to prevent the slow dripping tap of coronary disease, you should go, you know, earlier back in the process to identify it. That's why I've always been anti-Sheffield in many ways. Pretest probability, that's the Diamond Forrester thing that we addressed. Um, certainly in people over the 10% pretest probability, before you even think about diagnostics, you, you need to kind of work them up. So you may want to consider aspirin if there's any vague suggestion of coronary disease. Uh, you'd want to address risk factors first and foremost. And if they've certainly got symptoms, you'd, you might consider treating them if you wanted to, even before potentially referring them for diagnostics. And certainly, as we've said, for the pre-test pre -test probability of above 90%, you don't need any tests, treat them. Risk factors and all. Calcium scoring, as I said, was the first defense. I have a slight issues with that as well, although it's you know, clearly the gatekeeper in the sort of assessment of coronary disease. Is you're supposed to start there. But of course, who would conform to the lowest risk is going to be young white women who may have chest pains. Okay? And then they represent the lowest risk of all. You know, next step up are young white males and, then, and so on and so on. And the, the Diamond Forrester curve addresses that in terms of age, at least. But of course, young people tend not to calcify. So you already have a, a problem there that if you just did a calcium score in a 35-year-old white person who has like, chest pains, the calcium score can be zero, but they can still have underlying coronary disease. As I said, the, the, the tide is turning. And especially at the London Independent, we have a fantastic CT scanner for cardiac CT, the doses of radiation are low, and therefore, you know, you think, well, actually, I'll just get a CT, and then I'll know. Um, they say, well, what to do about, now, have you had patients come back with a report from a CT, and it just says no obstructive coronary disease, just shows an increased calcium score? Have you seen those? You think, what to do about them? Easy. Aspirin and a statin. And, you know, until science teaches us otherwise, that's what we do. Um, and I always say that calcium is both good and bad. For those of you DIY-minded, not me, um, if you have a little sort of crack in your plaster and in your wall, you go to B&Q and you buy poly, or some people, go buy polyfiller and sort of tack it up. Well, that's exactly what calcification is. So it's good in that it... it seals off cracks that could otherwise lead to coronary disease. But it's bad in that it tells you, well, it, it, it underpins a process that is underway. So I, that's why I think of calcium as good and bad. But in either case, even in the absence of symptoms or very mild symptoms, you would at least use aspirin and a statin. Now, one of the things that's come to light, and in, interestingly enough, um, you know, all these studies that have shown, you know, the value of statins in the vast majority of people, that statins uh, is, you know, prognostic, it helps reduce further events. Um, 
the one group of people who which statins haven't shown any benefits, either there was no risk reduction, this has only come to light fairly recently, you heard it here, um, is in people who have the absence of plaque. So if you're looking now, people increasingly are, uh, especially, you know, private patients, uh, but increasingly just anybody, uh, they're getting more sensitive, you know, do I really need to be on a statin doctor da, 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 just because my cholesterol is raised? It may be a game changer that if you then have gone down the route of doing uh, CT or something, you see there's no plaque, well, you could stand assured and at least sort of look them in the eye and say, well, actually, although your cholesterol is 6.5, your coronary arteries are completely normal, you could hold off on statins if you wanted to, or particularly the pe patient was sitting on the wall. Um, CT angiography. Um, you remember I said earlier that the degree of stenosis in a coronary angiogram does not confer, confer a prognostic value, in that an 80% stenosis of a coronary artery on angio isn't necessarily a higher risk than someone with a 30% stenosis. So as I said, we're trying to gear up a paradigm shift in our approach to coronary disease to sort of factor in prognosis. Um, this is where CT is because the advantage, if you look at what a coronary angiogram is, a luminogram, it just takes a picture of the, the space within the vessel. Whereas CT offers, over and above that, the entire thickness of the wall. And, you know, as I said early on in coronary disease, the, the actual activity is in, actually in the wall. That's called positive remodeling. So that can get bulkier. So we now think that actually if you're able to look at the whole spectrum across the wall, including the lumen and the, the wall together, that is called the bulk of the lesion. That does predict events and therefore offers prognosis. Um, as you can see here, that this kind of looks like a stenosis, but you know, even if you didn't know much about it and you were just asked to describe that, it looks angry, doesn't it? It just does. It looks really unpleasant. It's, and it's clearly a sort of infla inflamed process. And that conf confers prognostic value. That's high-risk lesion. So there's a nice lesion there which shows several factors that indicate risk in terms of a mixture of calcified and atheroma. Calcium is the white bit. That's just the atheromatous bit. Um, if you have spotty bits within it, they're all factors that increase the prognostic risk of that actually infarcting. Now, sometimes you'll see CT angiograms that talk, you, you even see it from cardiac catheters. Have you seen the term non-obstructive coronary disease? <coughs> I think that's a misnomer. And this slide here describes that. There's non-obstructive, there's normal at the top, the pale blue. Well, non-obstructive means that it's unlikely that that narrowing is the cause of angina necessarily. But that doesn't mean they're off the hook <coughs> prognostically. Am I going to be all right, doc, despite non-obstructive disease? So you have to be careful in your language. So when you see reports like that, you've got to, you've got to think, well, they're not out of the woods because it's non-obstructive. You've still got to manage them aggressively, OK? Another value of CT is in those young people. You've seen like eight, 18 year old boy with angina. Have you seen that? Particularly playing football. Obviously, you need to consider, I mean, coronary disease is unlikely in those patients, very unlikely, I've hardly ever seen it. The youngest I've seen is in a 22 year old when I was a S senior registrar in Whitechapel. But first and foremost, it could be non coronary. So you think of things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or aortic stenosis. But the other thing from a coronary point of view, and I see it because I do see CT, is anomalous vessels. So where you have this is the aorta as a sort of pulsatile structure, and this is the right ventricular outflow tract, which is pulsatile. If the, the right coronary artery comes out that way, and the left coronary artery is supposed to come off down here, but this one, it's coming off here as a little common origin of right and left, and it gets pinched between there. So anomalous vessels. So in a young person with anginal symptoms, at least consider if it's typical in symptoms, exertion related, consider the possibility that this is an anomalous vessel or other like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, 
we t we, I'll go over, I'll skim over this because we talked about that. Other causes of chest pain in young people is if there's an anatomical abnormality where the coronary artery dips into the muscle, we call muscle bridges. So there's nothing that needs fixing with that, but sometimes the coronary artery is squeezed by um, heart muscle contracting. Pericardial effusions can be seen by CT. I'll skip over that. Con it's also quite useful non-cardiac things where, as you can see here, this is just almost below the bottom end of the heart because these are sort of transverse sections of the body. You can see there's the esophagus, and that's gastroesophageal reflux disease. So the advantage of CT is when you're looking for atypical symptoms, it's quite useful. Um, CT can be therefore quite useful in picking up a lot of other things of causes of chest pain from reflux, as we said, hiatus hernias, pulmonary embolism, pericarditis, lung pathologies, etc. Um, you, I think, were spoken about 30 to 60 percent probabilities of disease, and um, certainly when you get into to that probability, you want to consider sort of functional imaging, stress echo, CT, etc. And between 60 and 90 percent stenosis, that's when we do angios. I'll just do a quick thing on women. I've got to get that bit in. About Remember that there's all these adages of oh, coronary disease in women. From the age of 45 onwards, coronary disease starts to accelerate in women. And we think it's largely due to what they call a clustering of risk factors. Because the overall outcomes in women who have stents or bypass surgery is worse than men because they present later because we take them less seriously. And they have less obstructive disease, so their angiograms may appear normal and they may reflect a different kind of process like microvascular disease. So the adage in women is to th take them seriously with their chest pains, to consider other possibilities. And in trying to assess, I said in men you think of erectile dysfunction as a possibility of some pre-assessment clinically that they might have coronary disease. But if you're comfortable with an ophthalmoscope, look in their retina at the vessels, and if you see evidence of retinal artery narrowing, that's, that's, the, that's the female equivalent of erectile dysfunction. But these days, I'm free, a lot of people are de-skilled in using a thalmoscope, and it is an increasingly difficult area. So think of microvascular ischemia as someone who describes chest pain. Certainly, if they've got risk factors and things, don't exclude the possibility they may have angiographically normal arteries but still have a process. And you would, in the first instance, at least treat them for angina anyway. Now, a certain percentage of them might be a bit of madness, um, male or female, and therefore you might want to consider other drugs. So syndrome X, I think you've heard about. And there are numerous mechanisms why women, in particular, might have microvascular disease. It can, could be due to um, spasm of vessels or the very small vessels themselves becoming clogged up. So treat them. In terms of investigating them, I mean, you can use sometimes MRI, and sometimes I have a, I'm the, I'm a, in West London, I'm the only guy that has a particular piece of kit to measure endothelial function, which can be the underlying basis. And at the end of the day, that's the sort of game changer in ischemic heart disease. It's what risk factors do to your endothelium. So if you can test that, it's a usually a good indicator. And that's how you do it with a test called the endopat which tests brachial reactivity of vessels, which tests endothelial function. And I've had great success with that, particularly in women with atypical symptoms. I'm going to kind of end it there, because I think you're going to throw me out in a minute. Um, well, <laughs> eased into the side. <laughs> but, uh, you know, take women seriously um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.